it's polar opposite from the last time you would have seen us hunting in Australia this time. I'm teaming up with my long time hunting partner, good buddy Jamie, and we're out for a Victorian Samba. Introduced to the North Island of New Zealand and Australia from their native home of India and Southeast Asia, Samba deer flourish in these relatively predator free environments. While Samba are very large bodied deer, mature stags can carry a maximum of just six points. The Australian Samba is also a trophy that provides motivation for a yearly pilgrimage to reunite me with my good mate Jamie, who's now living in Western Australia, as the Victorian Alps are almost exactly halfway for both of us. Jamie and I share a history that goes back a long, long way, and a competitive history at that. Dry, you son of a bitch! <laughs> what are you blokes on? Bloody <laughs> hell. Come on, you guys, take it outside. <laughs> oh, I guess I've known Jamie since we were young kids. I think 10 or 11, I think, was the first time that I met Jamie. We were in the boarding house together at school, and um, yeah, we've, I guess, we levitated through sport and hunting is a common ground. Dre and I uh, have done a lot of massive uh, sojourns into the Alps uh, back in the South Island of New Zealand. I think when we went to uni, that was when we really turned up our hunting. We were down in the Southern Alps there and it was just a massive adventure. As much time as we were at uni, we, we spent um, probably more on the mountain. That name, Mountain Man, I guess uh, most hunters you try and live by it, I suppose, or we did at the time anyway. You know, we wanted to um, spend a lot of our time in the backcountry hunting and like, yeah, we, we loved it. So I guess for Jamie, probably Mountain Man encapsulates everything that he was about. It wasn't just a hobby, it was a lifestyle hunting. So. Um, we probably laugh a little bit about now, but back then it was, it was serious stuff. Yeah, the, uh, the snow should be good. It'll be nice and cold, and first thing in the morning, those deer should be on those sunny faces, eh? Last thing you want is it to be too dry anyway. I just remember last time we were up here, it was about half a foot of snow. Much like back home in the Southern Alps, Victorian high country is prone to rapid changes in weather. Come here, have a look at this, and then come around. All of that right, come back over to yeah, the side. Yeah, I'll just poke around that upper ridge around 1200. Come down this uh, bit of a spur down here. It's two o'clock now, so I'd say we should be there by three. And if we don't make it to 13, just find a camp somewhere before that. There's going to be lots of this hop scrub wherever we go anyway. We'll be bashing through some pretty nasty windfall for the last 45 minutes. This area is generally exposed to a lot of snow and high wind, so just gone through some bad weather but we're suffering the effects of the previous few weeks of, of really windy weather, there's a lot of trees down, it's really noisy bashing through it so hopefully there's some light up at the end of the tunnel, we'll get to the edge of the face that we want to look in glass to. So all these eucalypt species there, their bark's designed to shed, they're a fire dependent species or the ecosystem's fire dependent so the downside for us though as hunters is that the bark's constantly falling and it's covering some of the fresh signs, so we may be masking some of the, the animal trails that we're looking to discover, but that's the nature of hunting in this uh, eucalypt forest. It's a little more fragrant than the bush at home. I love the smell of eucalyptus. Samba at this time of year are real dark, so we're looking for anything that's really dark and an odd shape, you know, something soft and round, and they won't move too much. Still another half an hour away before they'll get up, I reckon. As if to prove my point from earlier, Half an hour later, and we experience another rapid change in the weather, this time for the worse. Weather started to pack in a little bit for us, so we're going to put down camp just along this ridge here. We've got some faces to the south of us that we're going to look into tomorrow, so we'll get set up for a, a morning hunt. Get straight into our work and get our camp set up. The animals will want to find some shelter with the wind and the snow coming down like it is. So it makes our job a little bit easier. We can narrow down our search and look for more favourable conditions where deer might be holding up just like us we're trying to find some shelter so it'll be no different tomorrow morning when we wake up. Is that going to give me the distance? No, but I'll tell you what that'll bend. You've been sleeping buddies with Dre a few times? Yeah, we've spent a few nights under a tarp that's for sure. In fact, bivying was pretty much what we did for uh, half of the year during the warmer months. That way then you're only carrying like 300 grams. But they're making tents so light these days, they're just about competing with bivy bags anyway. Better off being in a tent. Look at that, it is actually going to clear up. As tends to be the way, as soon as base camp is finished, the snow and sleet abruptly ends. 
which presents us with a chance for an hour to glass the far face of a game before darkness descends. There's a, quite a bit of wind howling up here. It's, it's, it probably doesn't look as, it doesn't look very cold, but it's, it's freezing at the moment. I've got my gloves on, and uh, the down jacket is definitely worth its weight in gold right now. Unfortunately, nothing is seen in the brief window before dying light forces us back to camp. Yeah, it's a lot colder than I, than I anticipated. I knew it was going to be chilly, but I'm, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty cold. So you're day one down. We're looking forward to tomorrow. I think our conditions are playing in our favour. It's going to be nice and um, frosty in the morning, so that's, those are kind of ideal conditions for the style of hunting we're doing, which is going to be glassing straight out of, out of camp tomorrow. These boots feel good because they're non-blister out of the box. I've never worn a boot straight out of the box without wearing them before and they feel comfy. Oh, that needs some glass. Temperatures got below zero last night. As a result, I'm in my puffer jacket again this morning. These are north-facing slopes and um, we're just waiting for that sun to break through this cloud. There's still a little bit of s sort of spits of snow coming through so it's um, yet to clear up, but when it does, I'm just going to concentrate for a good part of the morning on these other sides, so Andre and I will glass for a few hours and see if we can pick something up with the binos and then work out what we do from there. Looks nice in there. That's what we're after, really, that first bit of sun. Yeah. However, the rising sun brings with it zero sign of Samba on the opposite face, so it seems a change of tack is on the cards. So we spent uh, most of the morning as we said, glass, glassing into some likely areas that we thought might turn over some samba, but unfortunately for us, we're still we're still in a samba deficit. So we've decided to pack up camp and we're going to push down into um, into the valley that we've, we've come into, which was which is always on our um, plan. So we've packed up camp. We're off. I want to try and avoid this ridge because it's quite thick. That hop scrub's really really horrible. So I just want to try and see what it's like if we cut off this. So the main ridge by about 100 metres. It might still be a bit thick, but it can't be any thicker than that stuff down there. So those fires were back in 2006, 2007. So they've had a good nearly 10 years to regrow and thicken right up. The thing I love about hunting samba in this terrain is it's the closest thing to home. You know, you got topography uh, with slopes that get up to about 1,200 metres and valleys that are down to 500. Um, hunting samba in this sort of terrain is, is what draws me to this part of Victoria. The only way to get in here is by foot, and you have to carry everything you, you've got to need for the next handful of days on your back, and you've got to pack it all out with you too. Coming through all this young, horrible hot scrub here. Pretty unpleasant having to push through this. Very noisy. Let's drop down and we can sidle around about 400 metres. Behind it. Ah, that's good. So we're dropping out of the what's called the subalpine and we're dropping down into mountain ash forest. Some of this forest hasn't been burnt in a while, so it could be very thick in places. I feel for the boys because I've taken them down and it's got very tight, steep, bouldery sometimes bluff um, ledges that you've got to navigate your way through but there's plenty of sign in here so I guess on the upside we're moving closer to where we want to be anyway it's certainly not easy um, we're, we're going to earn anything that we see but that's what it's all about we've been bluffed out a number of times it's just like that the whole way across the space you feel like you're sidling down a a reasonable um, contour and then it just suddenly bluffs out with a big boulder that's 50 metres high, you know. And you've got to backtrack your way up because you can't soil through it. Well, I'll put my hand up and say that I've taken you boys down through some pretty crap stuff here. We're trying to get down to the bottom of the valley and it's not the easiest terrain to move through. I was on my ass a couple of times here but it's all part of the game, isn't it? So it's pretty slow going, but there's a lot of sign through this fern. I can see the deer have been in here feeding on some of this banyala and taking shelter in this warmer fern because it's pretty, pretty insulated. So at least we're onto some sign. 
After a frustrating and testing afternoon, we finally battle our way down to the valley floor, and straight away we find evidence that despite the arduous descent, the decision to make the drop in altitude looks to have been a good one. We just climbed down off some really nasty scrub. I don't think, I don't think there's any humans that have probably come down there before, but we started to go to the river flats and we started to come onto sign. Jamie stumbles across some uh, fresh sign there. There's like there's a bed here. It's a good sign because Samba are very habitual animals. They tend to stay in a confined territory and they kind of walk a beat and wallow in the same places. Oh, you can see a bit of a, a mark here. Looks like a hind mark. And another mark here. They've been moving through. What you'll tend to find is um, during the evenings the deer will drop down a bit and uh, feed at a lower elevation. And then in the, in the daytime when it starts to warm up, they'll get a bit higher into the sun. So um, yeah, we're seeing all the sign that they've left during the night time. Some of this is a bit old, but there's the odd fresh mark. See this? They're breaking all this down and eating it. This looks really, really good. Oh man, this looks so good. It looks really good. Travelling along the edge of the river proves to be a welcome change from the scrub bashing. Although it's a bit of a challenge not drowning your boots in some of the deeper crossings. However, the potential discomfort of wet boots is soon the last thing on our minds as we encounter our first animal of the trip. Just had a samba honk at us there. No, can you see it? I saw it here, but I didn't see it run off. Oh, they give you a fright when they honk, don't they? That was a high end, eh? I, I saw it when it honked, but then it crashed off. The good thing is, this spur here protects everything that's just behind it, so we're in good country here now. There's just sign all through the riverbed. I could just see its big ears through the trees, and it's been just crashed off. <laughs> God, down here, front, my heart rate was up and it beat. That's a good sign. It sets us up well for tomorrow. At least we know there's animals in the area, which is a good thing. At this time of the year, there'll definitely be stags around, so. Yeah, there's plenty of rubs, there's a rub right behind you, see? You can see where they rub it off the bark. That's wet, but this stuff here's looking pretty dry. And I'd say that's weeks old. Yeah, so we're just in the area where that hind just honked at us. And I want to get up on this ridge behind us, because on the other side of it, nothing would have heard that noise. So I just want to poke up and over and have a look. It's not long till it gets dark, so we won't push too far from camp. Look at that. That's very fresh. That's real fresh. And look how green that is. It hasn't even had time to brown off and dry up and die away. It's been probably done in the last few days. It might seem crazy, but glassing for sand is actually a really effective way to hunt because this terrain's quite dry. And even when it's not dry, they've got such alert hearing, so you're best to use your eyes and use it to just break through that canopy and try and spot them long before they, uh, they hear or spot you. That being said, with only a short window before darkness, Jamie decides to follow his nose and beat the feet into the wind for the last half hour of light. You can smell it coming off here. Very strong. They've been urinating amongst all this, that's why it's got that strong smell. You can see where they've been sticking their antlers and that's not too old, this isn't too old. Look how fresh as you can still see a bit of crumbling happening there. <laughs> Looking get into this termite mound, still an active termite mound. Try and go real quiet through here. It's not often that spooking a stag leaves you feeling upbeat rather than downcast. But with three full days of hunting ahead, it's quite reassuring that Samba are present here and seemingly in good numbers. I can smell them again. They've been, they've been pissing all through this, it smells like.
we uh, we put up two, eh? Really? Yeah, a stag and, and something else with it. But um, yeah, up on that uh, little spur there, there's a bit of fresh sign. The stag's been giving it um, a fair bit of a go on a old termite mound and it was reeking of stag. It was probably only 100 metres below that, I reckon, that we got onto that stag. When we first got up, we just sat there and just glassed into us. Did, did you walk through a wall or something? I can smell the No, stag. yeah, mate, we were, we were standing next to them. Oh, really? Yeah, it does, eh? There was one point, mate, it was reeking. It sounds like Jamie's got onto a few um, salmon tonight on last light. All well, the boys are out doing the um, stalk off. Put together camp and uh, put up our shelter for the night. We're just going to stay under the fly. I've cut down some ferns to put down for a bit of a um, bedding, so uh, I want to get in my Ooh. sleeping bag, maybe get some backcountry on and get some sleep. Sounds like there's a few salmon to chase tomorrow. As day three dawns, stealth is the order of the day, which means calling in the makeup department. You're going to a kid's birthday party, you look like a bloody rabbit. Being right in amongst the animals means it's crucial that we do everything we can to ensure that we remain undetected. There's not a lot of banter between us as we make our way downstream, where judging by the map, there appears to be some relatively open clearings and north facing slopes that could be holding a few deer. And sure enough, the closer we get to the flats, the more salmon stag sign we see. I want to avoid doing anything on this flat until, until this evening, so we'll, we'll just cut round below this log straight onto that left side and we'll stay that side. Pretty much at camp now, we're just going to get up to this flat mate camp. We left an area behind us without um, disturbing for tonight. Just saying, as we cross the creek, we're going to leave that flat alone for tonight. We're going to punch in here and set up camp. And just as we've crossed the creek, we've popped up, looked back over where we wanted to hunt tonight. And uh, there's a samba there. Jamie's managed to get a shot away. I'm pretty confident of the shot. It was a standing shot. It's about probably 90 metres. So um, we'll go and have a look. So we get the samba's yeah, yeah. obviously walked straight through the creek here. Sure, somewhere around here. Yeah. Oh, here we go, here we go, blood, 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 blood. Blood here. It's looking pretty red, could be a lung shot. Yeah, could be a, um, could be a bit of a track here. We've given it a good 20 minutes anyway, so at least that's let it probably sit down and uh, start to seize up. But on the shot, she just bolted straight out through the scrub, almost as if she wasn't hurt. You can actually see a whole heap of blood on here as well, where she's come brushing through. It could be spilling out, hopefully it's not too low in the leg. I did shoot with my bag on. Oh, no, nah, look, that's pretty high on it. I'm pretty confident of a good hit here because you can see she's carried this blood trail all the way through. You can see it for the next five metres. 180 grain, I don't think she's going to be too far. Hey, here we are. She's just here. Oh, good stuff, bro. Good stuff. Wouldn't want to do it with anyone else, mate. Yeah, that's that's awesome. pretty good. Bit of camp, mate. Oh, yeah, so she's, she's run all of about uh, 20 metres and then piled up in this hop scrub. You can actually see how much they've browsed back. If you look across here, they're browsing back all this. This is all caprosma. This is that stuff I was telling you about. Yeah, um, yeah they, they just love it. So they're breaking it all. These deer these, will be well fed, good condition. Ah, oh, bloody good. Yeah, so where's that shot? No, nah, she's high in the lung, but it would have... Um, it's a good eater. It's only a yearling. Yeah, it would have shocked it. Andre had a, uh, had a bet with me that he'd be able to carry out a, a Samba hole back to camp. I think you'll probably do this, bro. Oh man, I'm not in the mood, eh? No. <laughs> You're not going to get me carrying it. No. We're going to cut these tarsal glands, tarsal, out. tarsal glands out and put on our clothing so it masks it. So you know before when we were looking at those scratches in the ground? Well, when they scratch with their feet, they're, they're actually also 
putting their scent all over those same places where those stags are marking up. So, so yeah, that's, that's their way of communicating. Samba and, and a few different glands, and, and this is their preorbital, which they use to preach and mark on. And then what Jamie's talking about are these tarsal glands, and they use that to mark scent. So this this okay. kind of wet spot there, there's a gland in there. That Smell stinks. that. Oh jeez. Yeah, and, and, and then they've got another one in their in their rear end there. So but these are their main communicators. They use this to mark on trees and um, preach trees and stuff like this. And each each animal has its own distinct smell too. So That's the right. stags can tell whether it's a you know a young animal or an old animal. It's kinda of like their fingerprint. Sounds exactly. Right, let's go. We're probably still looking at a hundred kilo animal. Oh, this is meat for the rest of the trip. Yeah, the interesting thing about these Samba are the ears, like they've got these radar type ears and they can just move them around, turn them behind, front on, they pick up sound from a long way away. I've heard of guys taking photos, this guy Errol Mason takes photos with his SLR and he reckons at 200 metres taking a photo in a fairly open spot, he could see a deer getting quite uneasy from hearing the clicks. So. Yeah, they've got great hearing. The good thing about hunting in this sort of terrain is we've got that main river down there and it does actually drown out a bit of sound. So you can see here, this is the entry wound and um, it was facing sort of uh, broadside but quartering away slightly and it's gone through here, through the lungs and out this side. So it was never going to go far. You can see the exit through there. So it's gone through all the vitals through there and that's why she only went 20 metres. So that was a standing shot with a pack on. I'm not the best shot with a rifle at the best of times standing up but I'm happy with that. Takes me back to the old bush stalking days of the Kaimais. Being handy to camp means it's a short carry. This lean organic meat will help supplement the lightweight dehydrated food that we've carried in, which is a big bonus when you're burning a lot of fuel through long days of bush stalking. So because Samba come from uh, the subcontinent Asia, Southeast Asia, they've evolved being uh, predated on tigers predominantly and, that, and as a result their, their senses are extremely acute and a very, very um, hard species to hunt, especially with the bow. Um, they have great hearing, great sense of smell. They have these uh, huge bodies, but their feet are quite um, disproportionate to their size. Um, and they can almost slink through some of this country totally unnoticed and, and, and absolutely silent, which is quite amazing when you actually see these animals. They're, they're the size of small horses and donkeys. As well as being of nutritional benefit, the shot hind also provides an additional use. What are you up to, Jamie? Oh, just rubbing these tarsal glands all over me, so I smell like a hind. Yeah, you guys use that scent spray, I just uh, shoot a hind and use its own glands. It makes sleeping in your sleeping bag pretty rants, but just change your gear out. Right, mate, well, we're going to uh, head off downriver into uncharted country and. Um, Sounds like you're going to pop up and check out that. that yeah, I'm going to backtrack. I'm going to backtrack to where we came, where that nice wallow was. Might try and just sneak my way in there. The deer coming down off this warmer face. So I hope mm. I can intercept something that comes down into that area of activity. So I'll just sneak my way up there slowly, slowly. I'll probably beat you guys back to camp though. Um, oh, you can start cooking the meat. Just do a better job than your uh, tar casserole, mate. Mate, that wasn't my doing, eh? <laughs> We're going to rip into your your umu stew now. Oh right, yeah. yeah oh, how'd been... that go? Oh, she's a wee bit bloody crisp there, mate. That's perfect. It's very good when I'm making uh, a cooking show. Yeah, we're not a cooking show. So oh. Yeah, there's another half hour. Right, mate, good luck. <laughs> Dylan, you What's son of a bitch. Yeah. <laughs> With fresh tarsal glands in tow, Jamie heads downstream, but he doesn't get far before he's stopped in his tracks. See it through that gap just there. See between the little hole in the tree. It's a hind. It's feeding towards us with its head on the right. Yeah, could be a stag with it. So we'll just sit off and just play a bit of glass. And we've got really, really, really acute hearing. So what we're going to do is we're just going to pull the binos out, have a good look around. I don't mind sitting here for the next half an hour, maybe even an hour till it's dark. I don't mind. I just want a glass and glass and glass. There's another one, there's another one. Yeah, there's a yearling, there's a yearling with it. Now in situations like these, if there's gonna be a stag, it'll usually be sitting just slightly higher than them because they're communicating with the mines. The mines will be lower, the wind will drift up and the stag can stay in touch with them. That's often how stags will stay in touch. So 
that's why I'm quite keen to just watch these highs and just see if a stag materialises above. Or I'll keep glassing into that, that scrub. That scrub's been in the sun all day. Um, and just fingers crossed that that hind is holding stag. Very early in the afternoon for them to be feeding. That, that to me indicates that there's not the hunting pressure on them. So uh, one, one look at what this spiker one off to the left, there's a yearling in the middle and there's a hind off to the right. But there are they're feeding right down into the sun fern now. So there's a few over there. There may even be more than what we just can't see. With the river noise masking his sound and tarsal glands masking his smell, Jamie decides to stalk in closer to the animals on the distant face in hope of laying eyes on a stag. But remember, these Samba have evolved to detect even a stalking cat. So they're incredibly well tuned to movement. But the Samba's honk isn't necessarily the final hooter. There's still plenty of game time left. Keep your eyes peeled for a stag. Yeah, I can see one. I just can't tell if it's a stag. I can't see his head. I haven't seen its head. I can't see if it's a stag. Looks like a stag to me. He's just a young stag. I can just see his front tines, they're very, very small. It looks like he's probably in his first year of antler growth. He's just been on the right out to Andre. We, uh, we left him, he's gone up the river, and he's now going to come back down. Maybe try and have a crack at one of these deer with a bow. The stag I'm watching is too young, I'm not going to shoot it with a rifle. So whilst the juvenile stag is nowhere near the calibre of animal that Jamie is after, it does present a good opportunity for me and my bow. There's four of them. I don't know how you're going to approach it. You'll have to work that out when you get there. The trick here is to anticipate where the stag is moving to and position myself in ambush at a point to allow me to take a shot as he approaches rather than having to stalk in on him directly. This means utilising vegetation and contours to try and move undetected, but that's a hard ask in this kind of dry and crackly undergrowth. It's getting pretty close now. It must be within 70 metres. Um, Andre was just starting to make his stalk across this flat, but this flat's covered in fern, and I suspect the stag spooked from uh, from him cutting across because I could see it looking down. It was looking very uneasy. Um, but you know that's that's the trick with Samba. They've got those big radar ears that they just tune in, so I would have picked them up. Like uh, tough luck there, Dre. That was that's going to always be a tough stalk, mate. That that fern's pretty dry. Looks like these animals are up in a scrub country there, that fringe just off the edge of these river flats. So they were just starting to poke their noses out to get into, as Jamie was saying, a bit more active time of the day when you're feeding. I reckon the um, that scent that we put on us is working a treat. Spooking another hind isn't ideal, but Jamie presses on in search of a stag. Suddenly, 
he gets a reminder that Sambadir are not the only introduced mammals in the area, as the movement of a wild dog catches his eye. This is from a wild dog. See all these marks? These are wild dogs. And what happens is the wild dogs will live up in these faces and eat these frogs. That's why there's wild dogs around here and they'll eat these frogs. I think that concludes our hunt because I don't really want to push on. Andre's still probably another kilometre up, so he hasn't touched any of this country on the true left. But um, we'll leave that for tomorrow. So whilst it certainly hasn't been a bad day, with a hind shot and quite a few animals seen, the pressure is on to make tomorrow the day that all our hard work pays off and a samba stag hits the deck. Matty, are you hunting samba or are you coming to a kiss concert? Right, we're early start this morning. Dre's just going to grab his bow and we're um, heading down river. And we're going to split up again this morning. Uh, Dre's going to hunt the true left and we'll cut onto the true right. Hopefully we double our chances, maybe catch up later in the afternoon. Um, perfect time though, first thing in the morning to be getting out. Yeah, we saw plenty of deer yesterday in that evening stalk. So hopefully get one on the deck today. Alertness is key when hunting at this time of day, so we do our utmost to remain stealthy as we travel through into the untouched country downriver. Samba stags, unlike most other deer species, rarely bolt off when they detect a predator close by. Instead, they slink down into the undergrowth and remain perfectly silent and still. There's not much point giving your position away if there's a tiger on your tail. As the morning wears on though, the stags remain elusive. I was a bit slow out of the scratcher this morning and um, had him up with Bricky on the run, so I'm eating it while Jamie's reorganising his pack. I'm going to definitely go in there and have a look into those little northern gullies. Yeah, I think the north faces are, uh, is where they're at. Right. Yeah. Splitting up gives me a much greater chance of bow hunting success. As with any stalking, it's a whole lot easier to concentrate on the sound of a deer if you're able to rule out any noises made by you. On top of that, you've got twice as much noise and movement to overcome when hunting in pairs. So Jamie's drawn the short straw, it seems, as he heads off with the cameraman in tow. Prince. Yeah, I found a, a carcass that's been, a salmon carcass dogs. that's been ripped to shreds by dogs. It's just off the creek there. This is another interesting bit of fauna in Australia. This is a leech, and um, they get a lot bigger than this. He's just moving around. We're in a bit of a swamp at the moment, so I wouldn't be surprised if there's a few of them. We should probably check ourselves later. We're just having lunch at the moment, and this little critter's come out. All right, we're probably lucky that this is actually uh, August, and this isn't in November, December, where it's a lot warmer, because this country here, the swamps that hold a lot of frogs, uh, actually would hold snakes, you know? We just saw a uh, leech before, you know, there's a lot of life that comes to life during those warmer months and at the moment thankfully the snakes are dormant but uh, tiger snakes are what you'd have to watch out for in this kind of uh, wetter country and you know, if you get hit by one of those you're going to have to lie up and get medevaced basically before, otherwise you're going to have a nervous system shut down. Some of the time they like to hide under logs to get out of some of that heat and it's not the first person that uh, he has to worry about it, or the second, it's the third person, because the first one disturbs it, the second one aggravates it, and the third poor bus gets whacked by it. What we're doing right now is we're sneaking up on the same face as the deer, and there's a saying, if you're on their face, you're in their face, so you have to go super quiet. These deer are beating up on these slopes, a lot easier glassing. Now we're having to put in a stall, so we have to go very quiet. I just heard something just, just break a stick up here. The wind is kind of in our favour. So we'll just give it a couple of minutes before. Could be the sound of them feeding. Because they break a lot of these things down to inch on it. Moved behind this big thicket, but it's about 
can't see if any meters up through here. I just could see two ears popping over with just the brow that's um, forehead. If you see, see just to the side of that tree, just there, that dark thing between the two trees there. It's just the mind. It's gone back to feeding, so that's a good sign. There's another one below it. Look, there's another one below it. There's another deer. In any hunting situation, it pays to have a great deal of patience. And this is especially true in this scenario, with hinds feeding less than 100 metres away. However, after a prolonged wait, curiosity gets the better of Jamie, so he sneaks in closer to get a clearer view. Well, we gave it about, uh, would have been 20 minutes or so, maybe even more, maybe half an hour. We could hear sticks breaking, so there was definitely another deer there. And um, I left Dave behind to try and sneak in and then heard one of them sort of move off down to my left and I turned around just to let Dave know and did a little whistle. Just a <laughs> Obviously an unnatural sound in Australia, stupidly, and then break. About three of them crashed off above me, just down through this dry stuff. I was below them and they crashed off uphill. It was probably going to be impossible for us to put a stalk in without, I mean it's just dry underfoot now, but um, everything we're standing on is breaking and cracking. So uh, yeah, that's what we could hear in the deer. They gave their uh, position away, but it was just too hard to close the distance on them. So yet another disappointment, but luckily for the team, just a few kilometers away, I've got some news to deliver that'll hopefully brighten the mood. Hold on, just repeat yourself, mate. I've just shot a stag with my bow, mate. Um, you guys wanna make your way up to me? You've gotta be kidding, you, are, you have, are you having us on, mate? Are you serious? <laughs> well done mate, we, we got onto a few deer in the bush but um, I stuffed it up, yeah, I'll tell you about it when I get back to camp. I was about 80 metres when I first saw him and I just creeped painstakingly into, I was about 50 or 45 metres in the end and I let the arrow go. Oh, that's awesome, so you're back, he's dead, he's on the deck. Well, we've just had some awesome news from Dre about that stag that he shot with his bow. Um, I guess that's the benefit of stalking on your own, you know, you've got one less pair of feet to worry about making noise. So uh, on that note, I'm going to put in a solo stalk and let the cameraman head over to uh, Andre and see what all the fuss is about. Davo, how you going mate? You good, where's this beast of yours? He's just up here, just where he fell. I was waiting for you because I need a hand to move him. Oh. <laughs> there you go. Mate, I'll take that for sure. Bow hunting Samba um, is right up there in terms of the difficulty when, when stalking these animals, not, not just for the terrain that they live in. I mean, it's super thick, makes um, stalking with a rifle tough, but even uh, just their natural senses that they're hearing is very, very acute. So that was probably one of the hardest um, Stalks I've ever had to put on an animal to be honest. There was some really tough stuff where I'd spotted him originally on the opposite side of a gully. You probably see up the slope there where where I've come down from. Yeah, it's just fern and and there's bits of broken sticks and all the bark of those gum trees here. Yeah, it was a tough stalk, so I had to basically drop pack, get um, some camouflage on, and bear crawl my way down into the range. I had to cross the creek at one point to come up just, and he was, he was just standing up, just up, up here. I had to close about 100 metres. I got to within 45 before I could get an arrow loose, so I can see by the look of the blood that it's gone through lungs, heart maybe. Very quick, um, humane death. Mate, I just shot my first stand with the bow. I just shot 45 metres. So he was standing, he was sort of standing front on to me and I had to put an arrow right um, at about vital height and uh, my Northern Broadhead, 100 grain, little evil, and that just zips straight through, it was a full pass through. 
So sometimes it's important to look at your um, arrow to see uh, where the arrow's gone. I can tell by the color of the blood. It's nice and bright, but also these little tiny bubbles on the um, fletching means that it's gone through the lungs, which is generally a good sign. Harder lungs is where you want to be going, a little bit further back and you might be in some trouble. Ultimately, what it ends up with is, is your animal safely on the deck, um, but also a nice humane death. And some meat. Oh, well, I've finished processing animal. I've got a pack full of meat. I've got the head on my pack and I'm gonna beeline it for camp now. See if I can get an afternoon hunting. Even with the semi-mature Samba stag, carrying out the entire hindquarters as we did with the yearling hind isn't really a possibility. Not like that. Oh. So between the cameraman and I, we select the best cuts of meat, the back straps, loins and I fill it, and we make our way back up river to camp, with the trophy strapped securely to my pack. Well, it's 3.30, just got back to camp. We got up before dark, so it's not a bad day at the office. I might get some grub on. It's a ripper. Holy. Here it is. Quick. Get it, get it. There it is. Standing broadside. Come here. Dave, come here. Come here. It's a monster. You see it? Just saw a monster samba. It literally walked into camp. I just turned. I just stood up to turn around to get um, to go and get. I don't even know. What I don't even know what I think. I don't even know what I turned around to get. I turned around and I just saw a massive stag standing above the log. I wish I had a rifle because that would have been a dead 30 incher. He was he was huge. <laughs> that was Shanghai's the whole nine yards. I thought you were taking the piss, mate. I would have reacted faster. Sorry. The biggest salmon stag I've ever seen. The wind's blowing straight into her face and he didn't realise until I got up and moved. When I turned around, I just caught antlers just looking at me. They were like this. All I saw was this. He was standing right there. <laughs> Maybe you wanted to join us around the fire. Had to tell Yarn or two. Oh my God, if I had a rifle, it would have just been broadside on 80 metres. That's the quality of animal that we've been basically been searching for and it's actually come to us, so which is frustrating. If Jamie was here, that would have been an animal in our pot. Oh man, I, I can't believe that. Absolute trophy of a lifetime. Copy Jamie, you there on channel? As it pans out, I'm not the only one with news to report. So let's just rewind the clock five minutes. It's starting to come on to that golden time. Yes! There it is! That's my stag! Oh, that's a good stag too. You beauty. You there, Jamie? Yes! Jamie, there? <laughs> hey boys, just shot a stag in the neck. It was just just in front of me, throwing its uh, antlers around on a bit of scrub. Mate, you're not going to believe it either. I was just trying to call you on the radio. You've got to be joking me. I'm not shooting you, man. I couldn't do anything, obviously, because I've got the bow. Well, it kind of caught us off guard, and it just crashed off back into your direction. So maybe it's the same stag, I don't know. You've shot this stag, and I've, the, the one that walked into camp literally uh, would have been less than five minutes apart. Oh, no, no, mate. I'm down uh, 900 metres from camp, so it's definitely not the same stag. But anyway, um, stag on the ground's always good, mate. Mate, that's a good stag, too. Oh, yes. Good symmetry, good shape, beautiful look to it. Big body. Ah, oh, there's a big day. That is a Samba stag. That thing there would be 300 kilos on the hoof. 
James has called me and told me he's shot a stag down the river, so I've got to shoot down and give him a hand. So the fire's a bit premature, but um, I better get my skates on. The feeling is undescribable, but I can't wait till Dre and uh, Dave get down. What a way to finish a trip on a high. So Jamie's about a kilometre from camp. I've just run down to give him a hand with the with the stag, and he's just up here in the bush. I can see his head torch. You right, man? Yeah. yeah, boy. Nice. It's good, eh? And it's a ripper. I know. Man, what a crazy turn of events that was. Yeah. So. Wow, man, that's a, that's an amazing um stag. Well done. It's last man. light. It took a lot to move, eh? Look at the mane on him. Oh, he's in a beautiful condition. Look how look how big he is. Man, what a horse. Nice and even. Oh, mate, it's amazing. That's a great representative head. But that's just so common for Samba, though. Right on last, like this, this diminishing light, they just get active and move down off those faces. And this is you've got to be hunting right up to the last light. But yeah. um, we both come here and got what we were chasing. Congratulations on that stag with your bow, mate. <laughs> that was crazy. <laughs> oh, I can't believe that. So yeah, I mean, this is an example of an animal. He's got a great rack and just a huge body. Mate, what a beast of an animal. We've got a work cut out for us tonight. You can see these battle scars here, where it's been in the wars. That's definitely no tagged animal. You don't, you don't farm Samba. <laughs> and we're about 20 kilometers from any farm, so we're a long way in. It's gonna be a heavy carry out tomorrow, boys. <laughs> Once again, there's a heck of a lot of meat to get back to camp, this time requiring a couple of missions to cart out the boned out hindquarters as well. But it's welcome work. A two stag day is exactly what we were after. And with a full day ahead for the monster hike up and out of the valley, the more meat we can get through tonight, the less we'll have to carry in the morning. <laughs> it was like brow times are out to here. Mate, kudos, you got it with the bow, you can't compare. So one of the big drivers for me, hunting, is um, harvesting clean organic meat for the family and friends. Hardy venison casserole with some fresh venison that we've harvested off the hill ourselves. Might need a few minutes. Well, it's our last morning in camp down in the river valley, so We've got a big climb ahead of us, we're going to be climbing right back up the top of the main ridge. But we thought, after seeing that stag last night, we might go for one last morning hunt. We're going to grab the rifle, Jamie and I will leave the bow behind, and we're going to head up river to a spot where we saw some decent wallows and rubs, so um, see if there's another big boy out there. Unfortunately, we were unable to track down any more Samba over the course of the morning. So all that was left to be done was to break camp and load up the packs in preparation for the long trek out. We've got packs full of meat couple of mementos to take home with us. So the climb begins. <laughs> it's going straight up. Got bow, head, meat. Yeah, this is real world fitness. You're carrying a load on your back for hours on end. I don't want to put the shits up, but just be mindful because the snakes will sun themselves on rocks. Another 20 minutes, I reckon. Oh, we've broken the hill now. Two and a half hours into our climb here. Here we are, right in the Hansel and Gretel thickets. Bloody horrible. Finding it very tough, this climb. Just want to lie down and go to sleep. Dear diary, today has been the most gruelling day. I'm tired, I'm thirsty. I'm climbing most of the day. The last stretch, we literally have about 160 vertical metres. And when I say vertical, I mean, I mean vertical. This is where your mental toughness comes in. It's getting, definitely getting pretty tricky now. We're all exhausted. Uh, finally, we've found some water. Had our water all day. How good is that water? Far <laughs> right, that's exactly what we needed. I've got a bit of a lift since that. I have been pushed to my limit now. Oh, we've just got under the track and I'm pretty, pretty ripped about that. It's been a long day. We've just pushed onto the track and I'm wrapped. Boys are 
had a hard day at the office, so I'm gonna push to the vehicle and get a drink of water. <laughs> 